So we're saving the galaxy again? Who else is gonna do it? Awesome! Ah! Hey everybody, it's Matt here back again, and I'm here to talk to you this time about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Um, my wife and I had gone to see this movie a couple days ago, and, you know, <laughs> it's good. I don't know what else, you, you know, it's like, it's hard, like, to review these Marvel movies, because it almost in the sense that, like, you go in, you know you're going to get a good movie most of the time, unless it's kind of like a you know, an X-Men Fox production. Most of those don't really end up too well, but this one was really good. Um, you know, uh, one of the questions that uh, I got asked a couple of times when I was uh, going out to see this and some people, you know, uh, friends of mine were like, you know, do you think it's going to be as good as the first movie? And, you know, as much as I do like this movie, I don't personally think it's as good as the first movie. The first and it, the first movie kind of goes along with um, what I would almost call the Avengers effect. Like you got to see the characters come together from their own, you know, points from like, you know, Rocket and Group. You got their story. Then you found out what Peter was doing in a Grimora and then all the other characters like they all had their same separate things. And then they finally came together to make the group, you know, and that's kind of like one of those things you're never going to get that kind of like feeling again from that you know because this one you know we just jumped right in you know the movie starts and they're they're already doing something you know they're 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 on a mission and um uh, you know they're just throwing their banter back and forth so it's just kind of like that magic that you have with that first movie it's never going to be recreated again even though you can still have a good movie you're just not getting that again and you know as far as this goes, like talking about the Avengers effect, this is a, this movie was way better to me, uh, than age of Ultron was as far as like coming together with a group type sequel. Cause one of the things that, um, I think happens with the Avengers movies and why the second one wasn't as good. Um, you know, not only with the second Avengers, was it almost like a commercial for everything that was about to come it was there were so many characters i mean you just look at the box art for uh for age of ultron and there's just like it's full of characters like the whole box art there's just so many of them and each one of them is supposed to get their own little plot story and like twist or subplot and it's just too much and you know each character had their own little something in you know volume 2 but it wasn't like it wasn't like a main focus to get everybody their own little side story. You know, you had, uh, you had Gamora and you had Nebula, like their whole thing going on, like, you know, they're sisters and they hate each other. And, you know, it, you, you got to find out a little bit more as to why, you know, Nebula hates Gamora so much. And then, uh, you know, you kind of got a little bit more of the subplot between Gamora and Star Lord. Like there's something there that's unspoken, and Gamora is a little bit softer in this one. She's not as like ruthless like she was in the first movie. And you know, Drax. Um, you know, the funny like in the first movie, to me, Drax was like it wasn't. He really wasn't like a pulling in character. Like everybody knew he was going to be there, but they weren't like, oh yeah, Drax. And I think after that movie. Like, after the first one, people, like, kind of really liked Drax a lot. And he is, like, the one of the main comedic draws in this movie. So, yeah. I, I he, 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 everything he's, every scene he's in, he's really funny. Like, and, you know, sometimes they give him a little bit ridiculous stuff. There's, there's jokes about his nipples a lot, and that's kind of weird but i still you know it was still entertaining to laugh at it was still funny enough but uh there's actually like and i'm not you know this is going to be the non-spoiler section of it but there's actually parts where you know dave batista himself he goes beyond his range actually there's a scene where uh you know he's he's talking to uh mantis which is one of the characters that just kind of gets put into this and uh 
you know, he's talking about his daughter, you know, we learned that from the first movie and it's just, it's a, it's kind of like one of those very silent scenes, but it's done really well. And the acting he uses for it is with, you know, it's all facial expression and he, he did really well with it. I honestly, like, I didn't expect that coming out of this, but, um, the movie itself, although, like I said, there are some subplots for each character, it is more of a Star Lord film because, uh, you're learning about his, you know, father in this one. And that's, uh, the thing with his father is another thing. It's kind of, a, it's kind of weird, like what they did with it because, uh, it's ego. So, you know, for non comic book readers, Ego was like a living planet in the comics. Now they kind of, they did do that in the movie. Like, you know, Ego was a, you know, it was a planet and everything, but, um, not Star Lord's father, at least in any iteration of what I remember, not Star Lord's father, uh, Star Lord, uh, as, as far as I can also remember was never a, um, son of a God, if you kind of would put it that way. But I don't, that's getting a little bit beyond and I don't want to go spoilers, but even though they had, uh, they were throwing ego into this, um, it was acted very well. Like Kurt Russell, it, it's Kurt Russell, you know, <laughs> when he's on screen, you know, you're, you're pretty much getting something good, even though Kurt Russell kind of just is Kurt Russell and anything he does, honestly, but he was very entertaining to have on screen. And, uh, you know, I guess that's pretty much all I can really say about that. Like him and uh, Chris Pratt and the scenes they had, they worked well together. Uh, you would almost think they were actually father and son sometimes. Like it, it worked out pretty good. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, revolutions in this. The close ups of some of the loose storylines from the first movie. And uh I really kind of felt like this one had a lot of closure to it, even though, you know, they're going to come back with another one because obviously they have to. But this one had a lot of good closure. And I, I don't know, like. It's one of those films that when it's over and the ending is it's something, you you know, you're going to you're going you're gonna to be really happy also. And there there's a lot of surprises in the end, they kind of tease some things that honestly, I didn't really ever think they were going to go to. So it's, you know, it's definitely worth every penny of ticket admission. You really should go see it. I'm sure most of anybody that listens to this podcast probably has already seen it. But, uh, you know, to cut it here, if I'm going to give a review on this, I'd probably give it a nine out of 10. Definitely go see it. It's uh it's fantastic. It's great Marvel fun fair and you know you'll leave feeling like you didn't waste any money and you'll be very happy. So yeah, take uh, take the kids, take everybody out there. It's a fairly safe movie. There is some mature content to it. There, you know, of course there's violence and everything, but you know, I wouldn't take a young young child to it, but you know, your teenage son or daughter or whatever, go ahead, take them out to the movie. It's it'll be a great time. So that's where this is going to end and then I'm going to get into spoilers right now. So, as I was talking earlier, Ego, in the comics, was a living planet uh, <laughs> created by Stan Lee, if I remember correctly. And uh, at, at not one point did he, uh, you know, go around the galaxy banging broads. <laughs> like, And it's, <laughs> it's really funny because in the movie, that's basically, he's like, I went around... All over the place. I, I took the form of what I thought a human would look like, and I planted my seed. <laughs> like, and it, it's funny because it's Kurt. Like, it, it's almost one of those things. Like, if Kurt Russell's gonna be in our movie, what should we have him do? Well, he's probably gonna be a, like a womanizer, right? And like, sure, whatever. And I don't even think you know they, they didn't exactly say for certain, but because it's kind of like he's explaining all this to Quill, and there's like this. uh machine he has that kind of puts stuff up in like these like mannequin x statues to tell the story and there was just this one that it like it flips and he's just there with a bunch of all these different people like embracing them i'm like um 
So I, I, I don't think it was set to any certain gender. I think he was just fair game for anything. But he was a celestial, so that wouldn't have mattered. But, you know, you find out through that that um, Star-Lord's mother uh, was the only one that was able to somehow take, you know, and take seed and produce with it what was needed to create a half-human, half-celestial like perfect com- combination and you know that's ego was looking for star lord because he needs another celestial to follow out this plan of him basically spreading himself out across the galaxy because in each planet that he also visited that he went and had uh relations with people he planted this um uh, and almost kind of it was like a flower thing that was blue that was kind of shaped like an egg that he put onto the put onto the ground and it you know put its put its roots in and uh you know it would grow from there so he needed star lord's energy from being another celestial to power his brain that lives within his human his humanoid planet thing to spread it out across the cosmos and basically make more of him that was his goal because he figured Nothing else was, you know, it was just, he was him, he he was the best there could be, and there was nothing else that could be better than that. So he had to replicate himself as much as possible, which, <laughs> it's kind of cookie cutter, I know. It, you know, whatever, what other movie have you seen where there wasn't a superior being that the only thing he thought would fix everything is it was just more of him, or he was the only thing left, so he had to destroy everything else. and it, like it that's the bad guy which i thought was really weird because it played up the movie differently because it, it starts you know they're doing a job for uh oh forgive me i cannot remember the name the race the name of the race that they're doing the job for it was basically like they're the perfect humans they're all gold you know and uh they, they were doing a job for them to protect these battery cell tower things from like uh, and I, I can't remember the name of the creature, but it almost looked like a Shoggoth or whatever came down from the sky and they were trying to steal the batteries or like break, destroy the towers and they were protecting them. Well, here I thought they were going to be the bad guys because they didn't really, you know, they hid the fact that, uh, Ego was going to be the villain. So I thought these guys were going to be the bad guys and like, you know, they kind of were because Rocket, of course, being himself, stole these uh, batteries anyway (laughs) after they did the job because he's like, well, they'll fetch a pretty penny. So they're also like that. That race is after the Guardians and, you know, through a chase in the beginning, you see uh, ego on like his ship that's kind of shaped like a white watermelon that he's just kind of riding awkwardly through space and um he finds them tells you know oh peter uh, you're i'm your dad and you know you got to come with me i got to show you this stuff and he brings him to his home planet which is himself ego so as they're there we meet uh we meet a couple different characters we meet mantis and, uh, well, no, we just beat her, honestly. And, uh, you know, Nebula's along for the ride because that was the prize that the Guardians was getting from doing the job in the beginning because, uh, Gamora was going to take her somewhere. And, you know, basically, I guess it was, she was either going to die or go into prison for the rest of her life or whatever. But, so there's that. So they're on Ego Planet. You meet Mantis. She's a, being that is able to control the thoughts and emotions of others just by touching them. She can also see their thoughts by touching them. It was, she was kind of a cool character. She was not really utilized as much as I kind of thought she would have been, but it was a pretty, it was a pretty cool character. You know, I hope they bring her around again in the next movie, but uh, the thing that I alluded to earlier in the thing, there, there's a scene where, they're out like her and Drax, which they kind of get close, but they don't really it's not really in your face that like they might be an item, but they do get kind of close a couple of times in the film. And they're like sitting looking at these little ponds that have like uh, lotus flowers and stuff floating in them. And Drax is like 
you know, this, these pawns remind me of, uh, like the incident with my daughter and, you know, it reminds me of times with her and that's when it kind of, it goes like silent and the camera just kind of like pans over to the, like Drax's face and, you know, it, I'm a sucker for when an actor can portray an emotion to me without speaking a single word and just by using complete facial expressions. And they did that with this. And for a guy who in the first movie, they only gave us a, a few couple lines because they're like, you're a professional wrestler. You're not really meant to be an actor. And, you know, other movies that I saw him in, they also did the same thing. They didn't really give him any lines, but the, he pulled that off really well. Like, it was a moment that was so well done with, you know, the the cinematography and just the way that they portrayed, like, the whole scene and looking, you know, shooting him the way that they did and the way that he's just kind of staring off. And you can really see that he's thinking about this thing. And then they topped it off by having, like, Mantis touches him and then she just starts uncontrollably sobbing. And you just have the whole thing going together with the music in the background. And it was just, it was a really, like, sad but well done scene. Like, very well done. So, then we move on to, you know, we have our big, we have our big battle. Because we all find, you know, we find out that, you know, Ego's bad. We all find out, you know, his whole strategy for what he's doing. Which I already spoke about earlier. And uh, the thing that throws Peter over the edge, because he was almost being brainwashed by his father to do this whole thing. And it throws him over the edge because he is getting in an argument with uh, Ego. He's like, you know, you weren't there to see her die. You you don't know what it's like and da 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 And then he says this, like, which is one of those, like, stupid things that villains always do. And it just ruins, like, you should have never said this thing. It ruined your plan. But he just goes, I, it really pained me to have to put that tumor in your mother's brain like that. And that's, Peter loses it. He's like, you should have never have killed my mother. And, you know, that's when they start battling Ego inside of the planet because he's got, like, his brain core in there. And then that's when you had that whole funny scene where Rocket's trying to explain the Groot how to use the death button, the death bomb button and push this trigger and not this button. And, you know, there was a lot of really good comedy done in this film. Like, it was very, very funny. And uh, and it was, the other good thing is I really thought they were going to go really ham on the Groot stuff because, yes, we need to sell toys. But they didn't really like they, they had him in the beginning. He shows up here and there throughout the film and he has that part with the bomb in the end. So they didn't really go over crazy on it. So, you know, obviously our heroes win as they normally do. And uh, Yondu, in this whole thing, he has he kind of does a spinner Rooney, and he's working with them because you know him and Rocket kind of had like this co like collab with each other, and they realize that they're pretty much the same. And you know, you find you find out that Yondu took Quill. And raised him on his own because he knew what Ego wanted to do with him. And Ego sent Yondu to go get Star-Lord. So you find out in the end that like Yondu was more of a dad to Quill than anybody ever could have been. And it's it's sad because Yondu dies in this movie. Like As soon as he's doing the right thing that he needs to do, you know, he does the hero sacrifice to save Peter... Because he, you know, they're, they're leaving the planet and uh, Yondu has a jetpack and a space suit. It's like these little uh, amulet things. You can just like kind of slap them on yourself and it gives you like a space suit and a jetpack. Well, he uses the jetpack to get off of the planet, but then he gives uh, Star-Lord the, the uh, space suit so he doesn't die in space. And just before they hit like that atmosphere where it would be space... Yondu's like, you know, that uh, that guy might have been your father, but he wasn't your daddy. And that's when you're like, oh, my God, he did everything he did because he wanted, you know, he raised you to be a fighter to survive. And he was your he was like your real dad. And, you know, he sacrifices himself to save Peter. He dies in the vacuum of space. 
and they have like this uh they have a burial for him and there was this running subplot where the ravagers um basically uh shut Yondu out of their group because what he when he did what he did like way back in way back in the first movie that like he broke code and you know the ravagers was one of the things like that was his everything that's what it every, it meant everything to him and they kick him out of it they shun him they exile him but in the end they all show up to his funeral and they all you know they're like shooting fireworks out everywhere and then you know they forgave him they're like they're like they never he never really let us down he did everything he said he was going to do and he made everything right and it was a really touching scene it was very sad like the ending is it's not like a super happy ending it you know everything works out the way it should but it's it's kind of painful too so it's it's one of those it's a really weird like combination of like a beautiful tragedy i guess in a way you could put it and you know when it ends you still feel like accomplished though you still feel like everything went the right way even though we had to have a character die i guess you could say and then this is something i'm not going to spoil for you but because this is a surprise like um well no if we got in this far fuck it i'll just talk about it <laughs> the there the, in the end after the credits they have the whole uh you know, they always do the after the credits, so like before the credit, after the credit, big credit. There was like three different ones in this film. But the one that was the most interesting out of all of them was uh, they, they have a scene where the that race, there was the one uh, a female leader that was in charge of it all. She's kind of and the, they're all like nice and prim and proper all the time. Like their hair is always perfect and pulled back and everything. She's like sitting on this uh, like throne type thing. She's just like sitting on something. And her hair's all, like, disheveled, hanging down over her face. And they're like, you know, the council wants to talk to you. She's like, oh, they're, they're not, they don't approve of my actions and what I did and everything. She's like, but I think I have something that's going to fix that. And then the camera pans up to this uh, sarcophagus-looking thing. And then she goes, you know, uh, they're like, what's that? And she's like, I think I'll call him Adam. And that's when it ends. And my wife didn't exactly know what that was alluded to. And I myself personally, I was like, I, they can't be like, you know, I was like, why would you, why would you go that route? But it's, yeah, like I looked it up and I remember seeing the sarcophagus somewhere else before. I believe they're going with Adam Warlock for the next movie. Like they're going to bring him into this. And I mean, I guess that's kind of interesting. I, I didn't really think we were going to bring Adam Warlock into anything. I mean, I could still be wrong. I, you know, just because I read comics doesn't mean I'm perfect at this, but I think that's where they're going with it. And I'm kind of interested to see how they're going to do that because what they did with Ego was kind of weird to me, but it worked because you didn't know who Star-Lord's dad was. You didn't, you know, you, you would have never guessed it would have been something, somebody like this that was a celestial, a god, essentially. And that made sense that Quill was able to hold an infinity stone in the first movie. So, yeah, I mean, even if it's not following 100% continuity of what a character is, I still have to give Marvel Bravo sometimes for how they're weaving all this stuff in and using characters that they have that nobody really knows that much about and being able to weave them into the fabric and still keep, like, essentially most of the key elements of what that character is. So, like, it's it's pretty cool. Like, I know a lot of people get upset because they're like, oh, it's all the source materials right there. Why can't you follow it? And with some sometimes, yes. But with this, I think it worked perfectly for them to just make it what they it needed to be. Because really, what else were you going to do with Ego? <laughs> you know, if you were going to bring him into the comics, what else were you going to do with it? Honestly. So I think that's going to wrap this up. It's getting a little bit, uh, it's going a little long here, but it's Guardians. I mean, it was a fantastic movie. There was so much to talk about. So um, like I said before prior, I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10. Um, it's probably around the same rating as the first one. I still like the first one a little bit better, but they're still both equally enjoyable movies. You know, I, you gotta go see it. 
So that'll wrap up this review, guys. Um, if you like this, please uh, share this uh, share this episode with some of your friends. Uh, I'm going to be putting a video up for this on YouTube. Go there, uh, give it a like, and everything. Please, you know, tell me how I'm doing in the comments below. So, thank you so much for listening, guys, and I will catch you in the next movie review. See ya.